Noswaitha a croeso ar benig i'r darlith gynta yn y cyfres Gwyddoniaeth Mewn Iechyd Deleni. Good evening and a special welcome to the first lecture in this year's Science and Health public lecture series. We are, as are many others, having to adapt to the challenging circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic, but with safety being our highest priority. We would like this session to be as interactive as possible, so please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions of this evening's speaker. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to uh, introduce my colleague, Dr. M Matt Morgan, as this evening's speaker. Matt is a consultant in intensive care medicine at University Hospital of Wales and an honorary senior research fellow at Cardiff University and has very much been on the call face of the COVID-19 virus pandemic this past six months or so. Matt has practiced medicine across the globe in Australia and uh, UK. Passion is a word I very much associate with Matt and he is certainly very passionate about using evidence-based research, especially clinical trials, to improve patient treatments. In particular, Matt has a special interest in improving our understanding of the life-threatening condition, condition sepsis. Aside from his research, Matt is also passionate about many other things, including medical education and public engagement. In this context, Matt has recently published an acclaimed book on critical care medicine called Critical, and has been nominated for the Royal Society David Attenborough Award in Public Engagement. This evening is also an opportunity uh, for me to thank Matt for a gesture he made at the height of the initial wave of the pandemic, whereby he wrote an open letter reminding us that whilst within intensive care, there may not always be a cure, there will always be care. I know my own family found this very reassuring as I'm sure did thousands of other families across Wales and the UK. Matt, it's a great pleasure to have you to give uh, this evening's lecture. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Well, th thank you, James, and thanks for everybody who's tuned in uh, on this dark Welsh Monday night, a tough day after we've heard yet again about restrictions. Um, but I hope you're sitting comfortably. I hope you've got a, a warm drink with you because I've got some bad news to start with. And that bad news is that you're not going to stay in your house tonight. Instead, I want you to come on a night shift with me. We're a few staff members short. There'll be a taxi outside and I'm going to pick you up and go to a night shift in the intensive care unit. I want you to really feel as if you're there inside critical care. It's going to be tough. There's going to be hard times. We're going to be wearing PPE throughout it. There's going to be some sadness. There's also going to be some joy, but there will be an endless supply of coffee and donuts to get you through. So I want this session, which will take about 20 to 30 minutes to be really immersive and engaging. And so I'm going to show you some videos of how it feels like to be working at the Coal Face of Medicine and also read out some diary entries that are made along the way from when the pandemic started in March. So I hope you're sitting comfortably. Uh, let's get going on our night shift. Okay, so it's about uh, eight o'clock at night. I've just arrived at the car park in Cardiff to start my second night shift in a row. Uh, last night was pretty busy with critically ill people with COVID and with not COVID. I'm not wearing any works clothes today, which feels a bit weird. So I'll be dressing into scrubs or a surgical outfit when I go in, so I don't have to take dirty clothes home with me. I've tried to listen to something different on the radio on the way, rather than the news or a uh, podcast about medicine I've put some easy listening acoustic music <laughs> on the way and I think that's been fairly good anyway there's a long 13 hours ahead of us there's not many cars in the car park actually it's uh, Sunday night and I will see you all in the morning
Okay, well, that video was taken in March and April on the car park when you're about to start your night shift. And as James mentioned, one reason I'm talking to you today is because I wanted to open up the world of critical care to the public and to scientists and to other professionals and really explain the science behind the things we do. Uh, and so I wrote this book, Critical, which is uh, available now. And the start of it starts actually with a big global viral pandemic. That is how intensive care was born in 1952 in Copenhagen at the start of the Copenhagen polio epidemic. And the book starts with the story of this little girl who I managed to track down called Vivi, who was a 12 year old girl who became critically ill, but she survived thanks to the application of science, thanks to the application of people and equipment, and thanks to the application of care. Now, was I to know that there would be another global viral pandemic where critical care played a big, but not the only role by any means, then perhaps I wouldn't have written this book. Nowadays, people know more about ventilators and about other forms of critical care than I think ever before. But as we know from lots of the war analogies used, although intensive care and medicine was almost ready for unexpected things, a pandemic was always going to happen at some point. In fact, it had happened before with influenza. No battle plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. So I want to talk to you today as well as show you some videos about how it felt during those times in March and April and further on. That may be too early in many ways because now we stand at the foot of perhaps this next second big wave. So perhaps that will change in time. I scribbled some notes down in uh, the one thing I could find at the time was, which was my daughter's Harry Potter uh, notepad. I took out the door that first day I went into work. So I'm gonna read you some passages from that uh, as we go through tonight. Tuesday, the 10th of March. This morning, I packed my car with a sleeping bag, a roll mat, food, toothpaste, clothes, because I'm not sure when I'm going to be coming home again. I switched off Radio 4 and put on Mellow Magic. I'd upset Alison, my wife, this morning after I sent her an email entitled, Things You Should Know In Case I Die. Along with passwords and the locations of important documents, I wrote, I've had a bloody wonderful life. I've traveled, I've partied, I've had two amazing children. I've spent time with friends, family, done things I've never dreamt of. I love my job, even though it can sometimes be dangerous and hard, touching the lives of others is the best feeling in the world. The start of a standard 13 hour shift. The first challenge is where to go physically. For the last week, there's been changes to the locations of the beds in ICU, a special new large ward is open for those suffering from COVID-19 or about to be treated. We have just one patient at the minute being treated in ICU for coronavirus. I think this might soon change. I go up and check him, make sure his ventilator is helping him as best it can. It's also important to check that he's lying on his front safely. This form of ventilation we know can help oxygen in the blood. 16 hours on one side, the rest on his back, but no more. Otherwise patients can get sores. They can damage their face, they can damage their eyes. So we've developed a checklist to make sure that we do these things properly and they work. My Canadian friend sends me a picture on WhatsApp of a photo where hand sanitizer has been ripped off the wall at his hospital. This hasn't happened here yet, but who knows what the future holds. My lunch today, a cookie. It's hard coming home after a day treating the sickest people and I've been incredibly busy since the start of the outbreak. My wife Alison calls me a body with a phone attached. I tried to do bath and bedtime for the girls but my mind is elsewhere. Tonight I'm going to sleep in the spare room because I've been surrounded by viruses all day. Right, well, it's my first day in a pretty long run of shifts. I've only been in the hospital for about two hours uh, in the COVID area. And I just wanted to show you what the 
personal protective equipment actually does to you and this is just two hours in that area uh, yet alone what the nursing staff and cleaners and other parts of the hospital have to go through but you can see it's really pretty sore at the sides behind your ear on your nose and I've even worn one of these protective parts actually which can come off but it's pretty uncomfortable <laughs> I'm looking at myself on this phone I'm looking pretty tired and it's just a couple of hours in we'll see you later on So those are some of the tough times talking about PPE, but this isn't just about ICU. And although ICU is probably the area that it's on the news the most, in fact, the intensive care unit is just the tip of the iceberg of what times in March and probably times in the future could do. You know, ICU only works when the hospital system works. And that goes all the way from the GPs in the community to community nursing, to residential homes, the emergency department, other specialties around the hospital. And we all came together as a part of a large team, of course. And that's not just a team of other specialists, such as anaesthetists who we work really closely together and we are really grateful of, but it's also the people that perhaps aren't on the news as much. Actually, the rate of infection in groups like the cleaning staff in the hospital is far higher than those in the intensive care unit who often had PPE from an earlier time than some of those allied health services. One thing that we did see though, whenever we came out of the intensive care unit after those long tough shifts, this was the wall that we were looking at. And it's the little things in life actually that make a difference. You know, one day we had over 15 patients admitted in 24 hours to the intensive care unit. In total, we looked after around 100 patients with COVID uh, between that March, April, May, June time. Uh, but little things like this can get you through a tough shift or a tough day. On the right hand side, there would be a trolley with water on. So I think hope combined with water was probably one of the things that got us through. And in many ways, that first wave was a bit like a sort in hat for life people's true colours often came out during those times. We had companies be really supportive. We had IKEA deliver over 500 tape measures, which seems like a strange thing to deliver. But in fact, knowing the height of patients allows you to put their body on a breathing machine and set the breathing machine correctly for their height. So that actually was hugely helpful. We had a local ice cream firm, Sub-Zero, deliver a huge amounts of ice cream in the hot weather when we were wearing tight-fitting masks. We even had Michelin-starred chefs, James Summerin, deliver hot food to us, which, you know, again, it's those things actually that gets you through the day. And although these were tough times, in many ways, our life and world working in hospital was more similar to many others. You know, I got up, I went to work. I knew I was going to be paid at the end of the month. I knew I could pay my mortgage and I came home again. So it's not to forget how hard this was on people outside of hospitals as well, especially those dealing with financial security. There's a quote I quite like thinking about this, which says there are two important days in your life, the day you were born and the day you realize why. And I think for many health workers, although this was a really tough time, it also was a time of motivation where they found a reason in life to be where they are and that they could impact the lives of others. We had to dust off our instincts, think on our feet, solve problems, work as a team. And so in many ways, those times were kind of strangely positive, which is why looking at these rainbows uh, can mean so much. Okay, I'm gonna read another diary entry. Friday the 10th of April. People imagine that the toughest decisions I make at the coal face of medicine in the intensive care unit are medical ones. What drugs should we use? What knobs should we turn on the ventilators? Yet the reality is more dull. The toughest decisions that the COVID-19 crisis brings are much more mundane, but much more important. These are decisions such as how can we accurately keep track of hundreds of new patients? How can we disseminate complex information 
to large teams of people that change every 12 hours? How can we talk on phones whilst masks cover our faces and nobody remembers the phone numbers? How can we quickly train hundreds of dental hygienists to care for critically ill patients? It's these decisions about communications, logistics, training and workforce that give us sleepless nights, not only the medical ones. Medicine is what we do. It's what we know. We feel it. We live it. We feel at home in it. I'm happy surrounded by complex machines monitoring blood pressure and brain waves. But when we have to decide on which walkie talkies to use to speak to an isolated nurse, that's when the stress sets in. So while government in this early stage is focused on the procurement of goods and equipment, what we now need to procure is better systems of thought. The best advice this week was from a colleague to a trainee who said, no matter how busy you are during the next few months, make sure as much as you're able to sit down and eat your lunch at a table with a knife and fork, like a human. None of this sandwich on the go nonsense. This is definitely not how I was expecting to be spending Easter. It's gone midnight on Easter Sunday. It's another tough shift in intensive care and it's been a, a really hard one tonight for staff and for patients and absolutely for patients' families. Uh, we've sadly had somebody who's died and their family couldn't be with them at the time. They asked whether we can hold their hand which we did, and uh, whether we could play their favourite song, which we did uh, at their bedside. But it must be so hard for them not being here. It's not how I expected to spend Easter. It's also my wife's 40th birthday uh, in a day or so. And to be completely honest, I haven't done very much for her. <laughs> I've ordered some last minute presents, but they haven't arrived because the post is delayed. I had organised a surprise party for her, but that's obviously cancelled now as well. So I'm feeling pretty guilty about not supporting my children because it's Easter and my wife, uh, perhaps as well as I should have done. But I'm here trying to support patients, families, staff, the NHS to get through COVID. Let's hope next Easter is very different. A colleague of mine said at the beginning of the crisis that there's never been a day that lasts forever. I think that's uh, a song by the Levelers. Um, but, you know, I said in that video, I hope next Easter will be very different. And I still do hope next Easter will be very different. But I think now is the tough time for us all, actually. Uh, we're tired from a long summer. Summer is normally the time that NHS workers take a breath in. Uh, after recovering from the winter and yet we're going into what will be a tough winter uh, no matter what after battled through that long summer so I think that's the thing that we think about and I think that's um, the thing which is is going to be tough actually. Sunday the 10th of May. Covid has brought new memories for us all to carry. In a decade's time I'll remember not only knocking on the door of patients decades after I've cared for them but this time I remember pressing the rubber keys on a phone. I chose intensive care as a medical specialty because I wanted to think as well as to act. And now I realise that above all, I really just wanted to communicate with patients, with families and with colleagues. Communication is healthcare's most valuable and yet most dangerous procedure. Verbal dexterity matters far more than manual. Yet COVID has stolen face-to-face -face communication with families when they need it the most. Instead, we break bad news through the twisted cord of a telephone, where the power of silence can sometimes be mistaken for a hang-up. I know from personal experience that even the sound of your own ringtone on a telephone on a television program can sometimes induce panic when hanging on for news of a loved one who is unwell. What if it's the hospital, you think? So now I try to start every telephone call to families with 
Don't worry, this isn't a bad news phone call. But not this time. That would be a lie. It is bad news. The worst. I begin. I'm so sorry to do this over the phone. The call ends with quiet sobbing. We promise to hold the patient's hand, to play his or her favourite song, to tell them that their family loves them, loved them, because soon after they die. These are now the people that we will all carry with us. So to the nurses, the physiotherapists, the receptionists who file the death certificates, the cleaners who clean the empty beds. We all carry COVID, not just on our skin, but in our heads and in our hearts. How does it feel to work in an intensive care unit during a deadly global viral pandemic? Well, unsurprisingly, the number of appropriate analogies is small. In the early days, back in March, it felt a bit like being a first time parent living in a one bedroom flat when your baby comes a month early and that baby is unexpectedly one of triplets. You start parenthood feeling knackered after weeks of sleepless nights. Your good intentions to paint the nursery and have your bags packed ready have slipped by. You worry about your ability to care for more children than your hands can carry. You also worry about how you're gonna get through this unscathed. Even if you have enough cots and enough nappies, the physical infrastructure of your flat is not fit for purpose. Yet, you do get through it. Adrenaline, love, hope are your fuel. The early days are hard, the later days even harder. But your children do survive. You change your flat to better care for them. You get systems in place. You find others you can rely on. You cry, but you also laugh. Will you come through unscathed? No, but most of the scars are ones that will heal and remind you of what you have achieved. Life will never be the same again. Some parts worse, some parts may be eventually better, but it's after the novel has settled down and people stop offering help, that's when the tough times begin. This is probably my favorite line from a Dylan Thomas poem that says, dark is a way, light is a place. He wrote this on the poem uh, on, on his birthday, is the name of the poem. And I think for me, of course, COVID has been dark and it's tough now, but we hope to get to a place eventually, the other side, which is lighter. And there have already been huge changes in medicine, in society, some parts which have light in them. Now you are more likely to survive if you are critically ill from COVID than ever before. And this was a virus we didn't even know anything about in six months. We have the word intensivist in the dictionary for the first time. People know more about trials, about public health, about science to many extent. We are recruiting huge numbers of patients into clinical research trials to improve the care for others. We are running outpatient appointments using virtual means that we've been trying to do for a decade. And I think people have finally realized the importance of public health and public health systems, which can be there, even if they aren't financially business-like and do not make money, they are there for a security blanket when the times are really tough as they are now actually. And I think it's also important in many ways to try to find some joy at, at the minute, more important than ever, in fact. During that lockdown period, it was my wife's 40th birthday. It was my children's birthdays. The sun was shining on some days and you have to be able to find some joy in life. And that's even more true now through the winter. And whether that's through hobbies, through music, through reading, through cooking, through getting outside in the fresh air on a cool, crisp day. I think learning and remembering that point of life almost is as important as ever.
Well, it's 12, 13 hours after I last sat in this car and turned the engine off, and uh, here we are again. It's pretty dark, actually. In fact, I'm going to turn this light on so you can see a bit better. Uh, it's been a strange day today. It's been a day of two halves. In some ways, people are getting used to the rhyme and the reason of the day. They're getting faster with putting on the PPE. They're getting familiar with the way patients respond who are critically ill with this disease. So they've been all really good point points. It's also been a tough day and it's been a tough day because today is the first time where people have lost a colleague. Uh, somebody who we all know fairly well uh, has died. Someone who has worked in the hospital for a long time and that's always going to set people back. It'll make us think about them and their family. And it also makes you realise that this is a disease which we're all vulnerable to, no matter if you work in the hospital, don't work in the hospital. It's, and that makes you think, especially now as I uh, drive home to see the family and my uh, two girls. Anyway, I'm gonna put some music on. I'm gonna maybe even sing and uh, get back home. The final entry says, the darkest times often come just before the dawn. Although for many, this crisis was waning, for the staff that have been there at the dark times, now is when they need the help the most. That's the same for lots of society, for your neighbor, for your friend that you may not have spoken to in a while, for your family you may not have seen for a while. Please turn the hands that were used to clap for NHS workers and hold them out to pull us back onto our feet. It's fine to drop the ball when juggling through life, so long as that ball isn't made of glass. Nye Bevan, one of the Welsh founders of the NHS, said that the purpose of power is to give it away. This crisis has been fought not only with nurses, with cleaners, with doctors, with care workers, the delivery drivers, but by people, by you, by you all. Thank you. We also have the power to choose the future. We now seem to be in a hurry to try to return to normal, but I'm in a hurry to remember which parts of normal are really worth returning to. Thank you all for listening. If you want to read more about intensive care or some of the views that I and colleagues and others have on things at the minute, uh, have a look on this website if you want. There are links to social media on there. The book Critical uh, is available and I do do some free open access writing in the British Medical Journal that you can find also. Thank you all for listening. Uh, that's about half an hour of me talking and what I'd really, really like to do more than ever now uh, is listen actually and listen to the questions that you all have. I think there's a question box on Zoom that you can type things into. I'm going to go through as many of those as I can uh, and I think James is going to come back on and uh, ask some questions as well. I'd love to hear from you through social media or through this website and thank you for giving me the chance to talk to you all tonight. Matt, uh, thanks Eric, so much for so many moving insights there. Um, I'm sure um, they've been much appreciated this evening. But we do have a few questions uh, starting to come in, Matt. I, you, I know you've already touched on it briefly about how we might be better placed for the forthcoming uh, wave. But could you could you tell us a little bit, a little bit more detail about how how um, ready we are for the second wave and how things might be different in terms of treatment for patients? Yeah, so I guess we could look at that in in a few different ways. You know, the most obvious way is in terms of treatments that we have. And one of the biggest studies in COVID in the world was run out of the University of Oxford. It was conducted in over 170 sites in the UK. 
uh, we recruited a huge amount of patients in Cardiff to that study. That's the recovery study. And the interesting thing about these studies, they aren't just one study. It's not just one study looking at one drug. They are what are called adaptive studies. So the interventions used change regularly, actually, as the statistics are, are built up. And what we knew in June is that one very cheap, relatively safe drug called dexamethasone, which is a steroid, has a huge impact on the chances of getting through COVID. It reduces your chance of needing to have a breathing machine. And even if you're on a breathing machine, it can reduce the chances of you dying by up to a third, which is a huge amount actually for a drug that costs you know, less than a pound. It's fantastic news, not just for the UK and for patients and for hospital systems, but globally, in fact. There's another drug, remdesivir, that we now know probably shortens the duration of you becoming unwell. Probably doesn't save lives, but it probably gets people better more quickly, which in itself may be a good. And there are a huge amount of other drugs and therapies you know, on the way. So that's one thing how, how things have changed. I we would, also... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, just following up on that, would you just like to comment uh, quickly on the treatments that President Trump received, that cocktail of monoclonal antibodies? Uh, is that... Yeah, something that's tri being trialled in the UK? Or? Yeah, so he discussed this, it's called Regeneron, and it's a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies, and it's already in clinical trials through these trials in the UK, through recovery and remap cap, uh, which is an intensive care trial. So yes, it's being trialled. There is no conclusive data that it's helpful yet, uh, despite what uh, the president said about that. He also received, of course, the treatments we know do work, dexamethasone. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's an open question really at the minute. In terms of other things, we are probably using more oxygen via face mask rather than breathing machines than we did in wave one. That's because we now know that's relatively safe to do and it can be effective. So that's one big change. And of course, the policies, the procedures, the training, all of those things have changed. What that now means is compared to wave one, where the chances of you surviving were probably around 40% in, so, in some cases, the chances of you surviving on intensive care now are up to 80% actually. So there's been a huge change in that fact. I also think if this is wave two, it will probably be a much more slow and steady rise. And it will probably you know, put more strain on the wider hospital rather than just critical care you know covid isn't just about intensive care at all yep. it's about all of those other support services so yes things are different yes things are better uh, but you know we, we'll have to see whether that translates into the reality of working and surviving in a health system which in winter even in normal years is at a tough time in winter yeah Matt, another question that's come in regarding the, the mental toll on staff. Um, do you think staff have received sufficient support uh, in this regard? Well, it's hard to comment broadly. You know, I know where I work fairly early on, there was a task force set up for well-being. Uh, and that can be things as simple as the canteen hours were extended from fairly restrictive to 24 hours. And I know it seems uh, silly to talk about food, but actually it's those things that get you through a tough run of night shifts or, or a really tough shift, for example. There are also formalised wellbeing and support services where I work, which we're very lucky, run by psychologists, for example. And the NHS itself has more broadly wellbeing uh, support services. But what I would say is that, like everything, you know, prevention is better than cure. And the key is having the services and tools to do your job properly. Mm -hmm. Not say you don't then need support services, of course you do, um, but it's getting those fundamentals right. You know, having a uniform, having hot food available, having somewhere to park your car, all of those simple things will probably do as much, if not more, for staff wellbeing as many of these fantastic professional services that we have, really. Yeah. 
Uh, question here, my, uh, which day was the hardest for you during the pandemic and why? Yeah, that's tough. I guess there's probably two hardest days. One of them was one of the videos you saw actually, where you know you you read in newspapers that it's the staff there holding patients' hands sometimes, and it can be easy to to forget how impactful that is actually. Uh, and that night shift was one of those times. We do allow families to come in for difficult times for end of life care. That's really important. We allow compassionate visits uh, today in the NHS, and we did then. But some people are so unwell that the timing of that just isn't possible. So that was probably one of the hardest days. The second hardest day actually was for a, probably for a different reason. Just as the pandemic was weaning, uh, I was cycling home from hospital uh, and, and collided with another cyclist and I broke my hand. Uh, and that was a hard day, not because of the hand, although that was an issue, but it's because, you know, the thoughts of letting colleagues down. You know, we're a tight team. It's a really tight rotor. In fact, I write the rotor uh, for the intensive care unit. Uh, and then the thoughts of not being able to help out other colleagues for a month, five weeks um, was pretty tough. So that was hard for other reasons, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and just to add to that, you know, none of these things are unique to me at all. You know, there are people up and down the healthcare system in Wales and beyond, not working in intensive care, GPs in the community, nursing staff in the community, the lab staff, who, who often, you know, we don't think about the forefront of our mind. Yeah. So, you know, none of these things are special to me whatsoever. Uh, and of course, not even just in the health system. Like I said in the talk, we are lucky in a in a way that I go to work, I know I'm going to be paid, I can pay my mortgage. So it's I, I absolutely don't underestimate the enormity of how difficult it is for much of society, especially in Wales now when this second period of lockdown has been announced, actually. Absolutely, yeah. Matt, uh, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but uh, if you could change anything as to how we reacted uh, to the uh, first wave of the pandemic, uh, is there anything that might have been done differently? Do you know, I, you know, if you look on social media, the, the world seems more divided than ever. And, you know, the criticism of every policy is there for anyone to find. I do think there are some challenges and questions in life where you truly don't know what the right thing to do is until after the fact. And when I say after, I mean, months, years, maybe decades later. And I think we're in one of those times really, you know, how do you know the impact that some of the restrictions will have on cancer and mental health? It's such a hard thing. It's the impossible calculation to make. And um, so rather than, you know, talk about timings of lockdown, everything else, I guess one thing I would say is there's a huge amount of emphasis on physical equipment early on in the pandemic about opening hospitals, surge hospitals, buy-in ventilators, for example. But of course, beds don't care for people. Ventilators don't care for people. People care for people. And it's useless having a beautiful, shiny ventilator if you have nobody who can use it. Uh, and so I think, you know, sadly, in the UK, we have one of the lowest numbers of acute beds anywhere in Europe. Uh, probably between five and six per 100,000 of the population. In Germany, that's 25 per 100,000 of the population. And you can't just magic up staff in, you know, a week, a month, six, or even six months. Mm -hmm. you know, nursing degrees is, is three to four years. I went to medical school in uh, 1998, uh, you know, 22 years ago. And I'm still consider myself a, ju a junior consultant. You, know, you can't just magic up staff. So, I think emphasis on staff earlier on uh, rather than pieces of equipment probably would have been helpful actually. But, um, how do we convince people to isolate and keep to the COVID protocols? And do you think that the latest two week lockdown will be effective? You know, this is obviously the ultimate question. It's behavioral economics at its greatest and any restrictions like a pill in medicine, 
is only as good as the number of people who take that pill. And compliance, even with simple medications in, in medicine, can be hard. So how on earth do you incentivize people to do this? I'm not a big fan of blaming people or individuals or groups. You know, I know there's a lot of talk about students at the minute, for example. I think there's very few bad people in this world. Uh, what I think there are, are bad ideas and bad incentives, not bad people. So I think we have to concentrate on the ideas and the incentives. And, you know, if I was somebody on minimum wage struggling to feed my family and the restrictions were such, then you can, you know, you can kind of understand how breaking the rules to do those things is, is, is such a hard thing not to do. So I think what it has to rely upon is sorting out those incentives. You know, if people are, in, are incentivized not to break the rules, then hopefully they won't. And having a shared narrative about that is really important. Um, you know, I, I wrote on Twitter earlier today a little phrase that said, uh, follow the advice now so that when we meet up later, no one will be missing. Uh, and I hope that's, you know, a simple, impactful phrase to remember how, like Nye Bevan said, the purpose of power is to give it away. You know, the power to ameliorate this pandemic is, is, is with the people. You know, it's not with medicines and, and machines. It's, it's with people. And I think governments and organisations should concentrate on uh, the incentives and the ideas rather than the individuals per se. Thanks, Matt. Just, just to follow up on that, um, another question. Do you have anything that you'd say to those who may feel that the fire break we're about to move into is misplaced? Well, probably the thing I mentioned, you know, I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't have any skills in that area. I'm not a theoretical epidemiologist. I guess what I am is a, is a realist who works in a healthcare system. And if there's one thing more predictable than a John Lewis advert every year at Christmas, it's the front page of every newspaper carrying a story about the NHS at, at wintertime. The NHS is always struggling at wintertime. And so, you know, unless you do something to help, then the vast amounts of infections, even in the young people, the problem with statistics is even a tiny percentage of a huge number is still a large number. And so you add those cases to an already stretched NHS system, then that's gonna break. And not just for COVID, for caring for people with non-COVID diseases, with car accidents, with, um, with mental health services, with fertility problems. Plus the other concept, you know, people have talked about her herd immunity, for example, and it seems an intrinsically attractive thing to do or, or shield, the, shield the vulnerable, for example. But of course, the people who work in the healthcare systems are those young people. We've already got huge staff sickness rates and so if you don't control that, then those sickness rates will go through the roof. And again, who will then be there to do the other non-COVID care? Plus the concept of being able to shield those in the vulnerable group, which is over 15% of the population of the UK. You know, that's millions and millions of people. Again, who works in those sectors, in residential homes and so on? It's the young people who are in the non-vulnerable group. So, you know, you will get translation of this into those vulnerable groups so i think for that reason i don't know the right answer it's so hard mm -hmm. but i think doing nothing right now won't ameliorate all those concerns people have yeah. uh, a lot of appreciative uh, voices uh, coming in matt uh, they've very much enjoyed your talk a question here, what positive changes in the NHS might have come about as a result of uh, COVID that you might think continue into the future? Well, I've mentioned research a few times and, you know, the thing that will get us out of this pickle is good, high quality clinical research. You know, we've already got a simple, cheap drug that works. We need more. We need preventative strategies. We need a vaccine. And that's through applied clinical research. And I think in some areas of medicine, such as cancer, 
especially blood cancers, being in a research trial is seen as a brilliant thing. You know, patients and their families battle to get into research trials. In acute sides of medicine, where I work in, in the intensive care unit, we have a very low percentage of people who go into clinical trials. And I think this pandemic has changed that. And that's a hugely positive thing. So, you know, for people watching, if, if family and friends and others do become ill with COVID, being in research trials is fantastic, not only for the individuals, you know, we know through the Hawthorne effect that the outcomes of people in centres that do research and people in research trials compared to not in research trials are generally better, even if the intervention wasn't the one that works. And of course, being in those trials is fantastic for, for others. So I think that's one big change. I guess the second big change is about efficiency in digital. You know, we are running online outpatient clinics. We run them in intensive care for people who've been discharged from intensive care. Uh, we are now all on digital results and, and, and digital conferencing, which we weren't before in the NHS. You know, digital in the NHS has been a really big stumbling block. So I, I'd probably pick out research and, and, and digital for the big changes, really. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got quite a few um, six formers, I suspect, who have uh, tuned in this evening, Matt, and uh, you've um, inspired and excited, energised a good number of them. Um, so they've been asking, uh, when did you uh, actually decide to study medicine and become a doctor? And perhaps a follow up question. Um, what, what qualities do you think are needed for someone to go into your field of uh, uh, intensive care medicine? So I told my careers tutor in uh, 1994 when I was 14 in Dora Valen Comprehensive School in Neath, uh, a, a lady called Mrs. Roblin. Um, I told her I wanted to be Fox Mulder from the X-Files, <laughs> uh, who was a spy, an American spy who used to search for aliens. Uh, and after she finished laughing, uh, she suggested a few other things. But genuinely, working in intensive care using science, technology, but also humanity to try to solve mysteries or, or complex challenges is kind of the same thing. So I think bizarrely, um, I've managed to be that X-Files person, even though it's a, a different post, really. In terms of the qualities, you know, there's no one thing. For me, intensive care is a great mixture of science, technology, and humanity. But the beauty of medicine is that there's hugely different sectors which have those in different combinations. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a brilliant, I often say it's the best job in the world. It's often not the best life in the world. And I say that because, you know, there are stresses and strains. Um, you know, I've got two children and you know tonight it's Monday night my wife's doing the bath uh, you know throughout training there were exams lots of traveling lots of time spent revising uh, you know the stresses of being in work are high so all those things exist and it's good to go in there with your eyes open that this is going to be a, a long tough career but sometimes some of the hardest things in life are the best things uh, and in fact, I I've, I've finished uh, my book, Critical, uh, with one phrase. I'll just maybe very briefly read it out. Intensive care is not always about fancy machines. It's not always about the great save. It's not even always about medicine. This was clear today more than ever as colleagues from our intensive care unit organised a wedding for a patient who had remained critically ill for over a year. Too ill to leave hospital, the wedding came to him as he married his long-term partner of over 30 years, surrounded by staff who had become good friends. If I could offer one piece of advice to those considering a career in intensive care, it would be work hard, ask questions, be kind to people. It's the best job in the world. Uh, I think that probably goes for much of medicine, actually. Great. Thanks uh, for that wisdom, Matt. Um, Matt, how have your wife and children coped uh, with the... Uh, yeah work and so forth over the last few months well my wife's a teacher actually she's a primary school teacher so she's had a, a tough time as well working in hub schools and 
doing a lot of online learning and Zoom classes and so on. But, you know, children are, are really robust and we try to have periods where everything gets turned off. Even the WhatsApp messages are muted. The phones go in a box. You know, we'll play a game of Cluedo or, or watch a, a cheesy family film or something along those lines. So, and I think it's important to remember to find joy in life. You know, the reason we go into medicine is to extend the inevitable you know we're all going to die <laughs> the mortality in the human race for the last six million years has stayed at 100 uh, percent so you have to cherish those moments before that happens and that's not in a morbid way that's in a, a, a kind of joyful way i showed you the photo of you know a sunny day where it was a day for water bombs and the other photo was my wife's 40th birthday so i think i think it's important to remember to try to find joy, really, even though it's uh, a tough time. Matt, um, did you ever find yourself in a position have to have, having to make tough ethical decisions as to which patient was going to get the ventilator and so forth? And uh, or did it never came to that? Well, intensive care is always an area where there are tough moral and ethical decisions. And the basis of those is really clear you know you act in the best interests of the patient thankfully in the uk i don't know of any system that reached a capacity where you had to decide on kind of triage or capacity grounds that may have happened in italy for example those early scenes of, mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't happen in the uk uh, which i'm you know incredibly grateful of and, and to be perfectly honest I think I don't know whether it is the role of an individual doctor to make those kind of capacity decisions you know I think it should be a structured organizational decision rather than putting it on one person but thankfully that never came up we treated people in intensive care the same ways as we would have made those decisions outside of the pandemic there were no blanket policies, and that's an important thing to say. You know, there's been discussions about do not resuscitate blanket policies and so on. There were no blanket policies. It was all made on a patient by patient basis, exactly the same way as we do in normal times, so to speak. Matt, I'll just finish up with one more question, if, if I might. Um, uh, and that's where would you like to be in five years time? Wow, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I love my job and I'd be, I hope I'll be the same place I am now working in the intensive care unit. I hope it'll be one with more resource and more staff. I hope it'll be one with more public understanding of what intensive care can and importantly cannot do. Um, and I hope that in five years time, the holidays that I've booked uh, that we haven't been able to go on uh, will be in the diary uh, for that summer I suppose. I was meant to go to the Galapagos Islands this year, it was going to be the trip of a lifetime to research my second book actually which is going to be called How Kiss Dog Can Save Your Life and it describes how learning about animal medicine and human medicine can come together. I was going to uh, that's been paused so perhaps in five years time uh, I'll, I'll hopefully have a, have a week or two in Galapagos uh, in between working in intensive care. Well, well deserved I'm sure Matt. Um, Matt uh, makes me just to thank you once again for a really uh, wonderful talk this evening and uh, again for providing us with uh, reassurance um, for whatever might come in the coming months so much appreciated. Uh, stay safe. I'm going to say, um, give you a kutch without touch, kutch to kutch. Yeah, and I'm going to pass you now on to my colleague, uh, Karen Edwards, who would just like to um, capture some feedback from our uh, participants this evening. So, Thank you both. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Thanks to Matt for giving us a fantastic uh, start to our public lecture series this evening. Um, while we've still got some of you with us, I just wonder whether you mind just answering 
uh, just four questions I've got very quickly. So if you've got a second device you could log on to, um, if you can log on to um, menti.com, which is M-E-N-T-I.com, and use the code that you should see on the screen there, uh, which is 31711333. And I see some people are very keen and logged in already. So just to ask, where are you all joining us from today, really? Um, normally, these lectures are given at Cardiff University, so it's very uh heavily cardiff focused so it's really nice to see that we've got some people from outside of cardiff outside of wales outside of the uk by the look of it so uh that's great thank you very much for uh answering that question uh i'll move on to the next question but people please keep voting um so have you attended one of our science and health public lectures before um be interesting to see. I know we have a lot of regulars uh, who always join us. So it's great to see, in fact, the majority of you have not attended before. So it's uh, a big welcome to you and hopefully we'll see you at some more of our lectures in the future. Fantastic. That's great. We've got eight regulars and quite a few who've been to uh, one or two before but good to see so many um, new faces, so to speak. Okay, next then. So why did you attend this lecture? What, what was your reasoning? Um, great. Okay, to be informed and to be inspired. So hopefully you have been both of those things this evening. Great, thank you. And then just finally, if you could sum up in three words how you would rate uh, or describe this evening's lecture, um, we'd be uh, grateful to know what you think. Great, some fantastic descriptions there. Glad to see, interesting, informative, inspiring. Uh, at the top of the list there. That's great. Thank you very much. I shall um, hand back to James just to say a, a final uh, goodbye for this evening and to tell you when our next, next lecture is taking place. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Um, I can confirm that our next lecture uh, will take place online again on Thursday, the 12th of November, when we have Dr. John Holt uh, from the Space Research Centre, University of Leicester, who is going to uh, give a talk entitled, We Came, We Saw, We Took Samples Back to Earth. I hope we get the opportunity uh, to see you again next month. Uh, stay safe. Uh, no star.